As we assemble again together on this Sabbath, shall we praise our Heavenly Father for the many blessings that he has provided. And as we open the words of his prophet and study from his instructions given to us through the Bible, shall we ask for his guidance, his direction, and his blessing? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you on the Sabbath, we thank you for these hours of Sabbath rest. When we may come apart from that which engrosses the world, help us now, Father, as we open your word to understand that which you would have us to know at this time. Father, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your direction. We ask for your blessing. We thank you for the many blessings that you have provided this past week. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you. We thank you for this opportunity to assemble together, to study your word, and to jointly come into the ability to look to understand what you are presenting before us. Direct us now. Help us so that our minds may be clear, that we may be able to discuss what is, pre- what is being presented before us, that we may wrestle together to understand this, that we may truly become as iron, where iron may sharpen iron. Be with us now. May your spirit attend us. May your angels protect us. May those that participate in this meeting today be blessed. May those that watch this meeting later also receive a blessing from you. For this, Father, we thank you. In this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, last week, we began to cover portions of the book of Ezekiel 9. Why are we looking at Ezekiel 9 when we have been studying Zechariah 5? Ellen White points us to it. Right? What else do we take away from this? Well, it means that Zechariah 5 is connected to these events uh, regarding the Sunday law. Right. Is this also not preparation for us at this time? Have we not seen, as we've studied from Zechariah 5, that there need to be those that are purified to be able to give a message. And is Ezekiel 9 not showing us the beginning of that message? So let's consider again where we were leaving off last week. Okay, so one thing about that. So we know that uh, Ezekiel 9 was used by um, uh, Victor Hutef back in... Was that the 20s? 20s and 30s. Yeah, the 20s and 30s. But the 20s is when he first, you know, formulated his ideas and presented them to to, uh, the church. Right. And, uh, you know, that actually um, prejudiced the church to some degree against looking at these types of things. Right. I don't think there's ever been because of, uh, of what. You know, the shepherd's rod have done that Adventists really want to look at this. It is indeed one of the least studied books in the Adventist church. Yeah, the book itself and Ezekiel chapter nine. Uh, I mean, obviously you'll sell all kinds of independent ministries studying Ezekiel eight and nine, but it's not a, a common topic. I mean, I've never heard a sermon from a conference pastor on Ezekiel nine. I mean, I've heard sermons on Ezekiel 9, but but even then, that's rare, even for conservative Adventists to talk about Ezekiel 9 in the church setting. Um, it's usually going to be often a fanatical group that's going to look at it, uh, and they're going to have some strange interpretations of it, Ezekiel 8 and 9. Um, so I've run into a lot of that. And it usually has something to do with leaving the Adventist church, right? Right. So... So we know, of course, that that's, that's not a message that, that comes from God in the sense of the Seventh-day Adventist church is not Babylon. We do know that they're going to start at the ancient men. And, and so that the leadership uh, is particularly targeted first, but it ap- applies to all of us who are Seventh-day Adventists, whether we're going to 
heed this, the warning or not. And, and I think because Ezekiel eight and nine, that the, because we don't really understand the book of Ezekiel, um, they're studied out of the context of the bigger message of Ezekiel. Okay. So, I mean, that's the thing that, that we've come to understand is Ezekiel's connection to Millerite history and to the repeat of Millerite history, which, which I'm going to address in the study after yours. So, okay. I won't too much about it now. Now, it's interesting to me because you bring up Victor Hotep mm -hmm. that when he began to become convinced that the third angel's message was the message that needed to go forward. Mm -hmm. That he chose to move from where he had initially been in Texas to California to be closer to Seventh-day Adventist communities. Mm -hmm. That for a while he took a job as a salesman selling appliances. Now granted this was in the 1920s. He mm -hmm. also took his time for doctrinal studies. And in 1929, after the collapse, after what had happened on Wall Street, he published his book about the shepherd's rod. But before he had done this, he established a company which were supposed to manufacture wholesome confectionery candies, or as Hotef would call them, health sweets. Kind of interesting that here he would be typifying that, that would have something sweet in the mouth, but something that would become very bitter in the belly. Now, one of the things that, that we looked at this last week, this letter 31, written to Brother A.O. Henry, was written in 1894. Hotef published his book, The Shepherd's Rod, in 1929. So we're talking that there was 35 years between the time that Mrs. White sent this letter and the time that Hotef published The Shepherd's Rod. Now, as we covered last week, this letter was not generally published. And it wasn't until 2015 that we re received access to this letter. Was it likely that Hotef would have had access to this letter when he published The Shepherd's Rod? I don't think so. Right. So, yeah, this would not have been something published. Now, as we were as we were finishing our study last week, we came to these paragraphs. The Lord reads the heart as an open book. Does he read the hearts of all? Mm -hmm. can, can anything be hidden from our Heavenly Father? No, we, we try sometimes. Right. The men who are not connected with God have done many things after the imaginations of their own evil hearts. The Lord declares concerning them, they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. Jeremiah 32, 33. We are amid the perils of the last days. The time will soon come when the prophecy of Ezekiel 9 will be fulfilled. That prophecy should be carefully studied, for it will be fulfilled to the very letter. How many times do we look at Ezekiel 9 as being a prophecy? How often is this particular chapter being set aside? Yet it is prophetic in nature. It is something that we need to understand. As she continued, study also the 10th chapter, which represents the hand of God as at work to bring perfect and harmonious working into all of the operations of his prepared instrumentalities. The 11th and 12th chapters should also receive critical, thoughtful attention. Let these prophecies, plural, 
be studied on your knees before God. Unless you take up the stumbling blocks by which your own perverse spirit you have laid in the way of many who have been connected with you, God will turn his face utterly from you and your associates. Are we today seeking to have God turn his face from us? True religion is the imitation of Christ. Those who follow Christ will deny self take up the cross, and walk in his footsteps. Following Christ means obedience to all his commandments. Is this a clear statement of fact for us today? Yes, very much clear. Okay. No soldier can be said to follow his commander unless he obeys orders. Whose commands are we following today? If we do not deny self, If we will not walk in the steps of Christ, are we following Christ? No. If we are casting brothers and sisters out because we do not, we we are disagreeing with their questions and their comments, are we following Christ? Then we are not. Okay. So who then is our commander? Well, self and Satan. Thank you. Yet, as Mrs. White continues, Christ is our model. To copy Jesus, full of love and tenderness and compassion, will require that we draw near to him daily. Oh, how God has been dishonored by his professed representatives. Those that take the name of Christ and are not willing to walk in his footsteps, that are not willing to follow his law are dishonoring his name the first three chapters of hebrews are presented to me as of great importance to enlighten the eyes and to direct the life this letter letter 31 alpha was written in 1894 this letter was written six years after the minneapolis meeting this letter was written six years after the message of righteousness by faith in Christ alone was was presented before the leadership of the church. And was this message presented in 1888 accepted or was it rejected? Rejected. The message was rejected. Why was it rejected? Because uh, of self. Because of self, because the leadership refused to take up the cross and would not walk in his footsteps. Is this clear to all right now? Yes. Okay. Now, the next letter, again, written to one of the leaders in the church. This next letter, written two years later, states the following. Edson. Who is Edson? Is it Peter Madsen? Edson White. Okay. Now, Edson White, what relation did he have with Mrs. White? He was he was her son. Was Edson at the Minneapolis meeting in 1888? To be honest, the answer is yes. Edson has been charged in writing to me complaining of Brother Henry. This is a mistake. Edson has not done this. The light which has been given me has been sent to Edson only when I felt his danger and presented to him that he was not to let his feelings control him. Did Edson understand the message of righteousness by faith? No. Correct. Of those at this Minneapolis meeting, there were 100 people at this meeting. How many attending that meeting of the 100 understood the message of righteousness by faith? And also uh, Ellen White. 
We had Mrs. White. We had A.T. Jones. And we had Ellett J. Wagner. Three people of 100. Three of 100 is indeed a remnant. Would you agree with that? A small portion. She continues, the thought that he was dealt with unkindly by any one of the office should not lead him to commit sin against his precious Savior or to let his mind be soured in any way. I assured him that the Lord was looking upon every unjust act. Every hard-hearted and unjust decision is known to him. I wrote to him not because Edson had written to me of these things, for he had not but because matters had been presented before me and I could not rest until I sent my warnings over the broad Pacific to save him from another utter discouragement. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have spoken to hard, unthankful, unsubdued hearts because I was commissioned to set the warnings before them, whether they would hear or whether they would forbear. See Ezekiel 3, 4 to 7, 16 to 21, 9 and 18. I will not hold my peace. I will not say to those who are going contrary to the light God has given to follow the imaginations of their own hearts. It shall be well with thee. If I should hold my peace, the blood of souls would be on my garments. As we are looking at this right now, in Ezekiel 9, if we choose to hold our peace, what will be the result? If we have learned these messages and we've learned the criteria behind them, if we hold our peace, what will the result be for us? She's already stated it here, right here. If we hold our peace, the blood of souls will be on our garments. If the blood of souls is on our garments, are our garments white and unstained? No, they can't be white. They can't be white. Okay. I must speak the words of the Lord. The Lord cannot justify those who have been and are still following a course of oppression. They are not doing his will. In their speech and their dealing, they are not following the example of Christ. They do not bear in mind, all ye are brethren. Matthew 23, 8. So if a brother or a sister is oppressing those that are giving this message, saying, we don't want to hear what you have to say. We don't need to understand prophecy. All we need is the love of Christ. Are we doing the will of God? Are they choosing and doing the will of God when they're taking that type of an attitude? I had hoped that the old, harsh, unchristian manner of dealing with the workmen would never be practiced again. But my heart trembles today for the workers in high and low position. These things are an offense to God, and he will not pass them by. He will surely judge for these things, for men are made to err from the Lord. Everyone will be tested through temptation. What do we see in this statement if everyone will be tested through temptation? Does that mean some will not be tested? No, all of us. Exactly. One thing I am sure I cannot do, and that is to expel unbelief, to make those believe who have had evidence piled upon evidence. They are now less inclined to believe. There are reasons, they think, for the position they take. Their minds are given to unbelief and doubt. None can change the impressions made upon them by the sowing of the seeds of unbelief. If they want the thing to be so, if they lay their plans, work to them, suppose them all right, 
and then their imaginings are reproved as unwise, Satan steps in and says, even to those who have met the same things in others, somebody has told her. Excuse me. If they lay their plans, work to them, suppose them all right, and then their imaginings are reproved as unwise, Satan steps in and says, even to those who have met the same things in others, somebody has told her. All these leading men have to do to place themselves in the channel of unbelief is to say, somebody has told her. Little did we suppose that individuals who have seemed to be firmly established would go over the ground which others have traveled to their own backsliding and ruin. When a brother or a sister is tempted, are we to cast them out and to treat them as unworthy in in and of the fellowship of believers. We are all being tested through temptation. We should praise God in all things, even when we are being tested. Into the next non-published document, letter 142 of 1899. 11 years after the 1888 message. I've been instructed to bear the message from the Lord to these institutions that the Lord holds them accountable for it. The Lord would have those who handle his work use no common fire in their censers, but the sacred fire of the Lord's own kindling, which demonstrates that the divine and the human agencies are cooperating. Is the understanding of Leviticus 26 and the seven times a fire of man's kindling, or is this the sacred fire of the Lord's own kindling? To those who have taken unfair advantages, thinking that they were excusable because it was for the cause of God, the Lord says, I hate robbery for burnt offerings. Isaiah 61, verse 8. Here we come again to Zechariah 5, 1 to 4. As Zechariah writes, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said to me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits. The breadth thereof is 10 cubits. And he said, Unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of the house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. The great roll, 20 cubits in length and 10 cubits in breadth, was the measurement of the porch of Solomon's temple. In this roll is written the name of the wrongdoer unless he repents of his wrong. The Lord's eye is upon every transaction, and his judgment will come upon those who do wrong. The ninth chapter of Ezekiel should be studied in connection with Ezekiel 2, 1 through 10, and the fifth chapter of Revelation. So here again, Zechariah 5, Ezekiel 9. Let us make thorough work for eternity. Those occupying responsible positions in our institutions who have a high estimate of their own labors, while they depreciate the work of those who carry the burden in poverty-stricken districts, are not clean in the sight of the Lord. If they are not clean in the sight of the Lord, do they have spotless garments? Are they then, if they are not clean in the sight of the Lord, are they purified to be able to give the final message? No, they aren't. They have not hearts of tender compassion. They do not cooperate with the workers in the barren fields. If a favor is asked of them, they refuse to grant it. They do not have it in them to take 
in the situation of their fellow workers who struggle on dis- on under discouraging circumstances and with small wages. The Lord will bring every soul of them into trying circumstances. He cannot prosper the selfish, uncourteous, ungenerous spirit. The Lord estimates the labor done, and he values just as highly the one who labors in hard fields without faculties as those who allow him to ask in vain. Is it not possible for it was facilities without facilities. Okay. Thank you for the correction. Is it not possible for those handling sacred responsibilities to remember that in their several positions of trust, they are to manifest exactitude in every respect as examples of Jesus Christ? Their position as superiors demands this of them. But whether they be superiors, equals, or inferiors, they must begin at the beginning. Christ says, take my yoke of restraint and obedience upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest. Now, if this yoke is a yoke of restraint and obedience, does this allow us to run off all over the place to do as we see fit? No. Okay. The heart will then be made right with God through the creative power of Christ. Partakers of his divine nature, they are transformed. Then the whole building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. What are we said to be today, brothers and sisters? Are we not to be the living stones that form the holy temple unto the Lord? The world would not be what it now is if professed believers in Christ were receivers of his divine nature. What does this statement say to you today? Well, it's telling us that the state of things as they are in the world today are due to the failure of God's people, to a large degree anyway. Agreed. It is the example of men who claim to believe the truth, but who do not practice the truth that detracts from the influence of Christianity. They hold the truth as a theory, but unrighteousness surely characterizes their course of action. Many occupy high positions of responsibility and yet reveal that they are far away from Christ because they are destitute of Christianity. Please read the ninth and tenth chapters of Ezekiel. Should we not seek to understand the work which God requires us to do? Its results are sacred and awful. Here again, she's returning to tell us to read the ninth and the tenth chapters of Ezekiel. And how did she describe these chapters just a few paragraphs before this? Are these not prophecies? Yes. If these are prophecies, are they, I mean, are we to consider them fulfilled? No, they are yet to be fulfilled. The process. They have yet to be fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? I thought in listening to so many other speakers that all of the prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled. Yeah, I've heard that too. All Hmm. right. If one thread of selfishness is woven into God's service, he is greatly dishonored. That is a frightful statement. Unless those who have a knowledge of the truth are sanctified through the truth, their profession counts nothing. And their condemnation will be proportionate to the light granted to them which they have not honored by walking in the light as Christ is in the light. 
truth as it is in Jesus is the creating power of the grace of Christ. Those who claim to have advanced light must reveal the influence of that light in their words, their deportment, their voice, their actions at all times and in all places. If we have a thread of selfishness in our garment, is our garment pure? No. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. The first work of teachers, of physicians, directors, is to submit themselves to the yoke of Christ. This is our first work. They must obey the words, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Matthew eleven twenty nine. This is the result of keeping self under the sanctification of the truth. Our first business, and it should always be made highest, is to expel from the soul temple everything that will not harmonize with Christ. His spirit must abide in us by faith. We are to keep the heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life proverbs 4:23 but then pleasant words will be spoken notwithstanding that temptations are pressing in to occupy the soul temple in the ninth chapter of ezekiel is portrayed the fate of the men of responsibility who have not glorified god by faithfulness and integrity read this chapter Notice especially verses 4 through 6. The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all of the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at the ancient men which were before the house. At the appointed time, the Lord of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, will do his work most thoroughly. Now, Mrs. White claims that this is a prophecy, right? Is that a correct statement? Mm -hmm. Say so, yeah. Okay. As we have been addressing this, has this prophecy been fulfilled? No. So here we have this as Ezekiel had written, where he is told to go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem. Did Ezekiel do this? Where was well, the angel? The angel did that. Okay, but where was Ezekiel at the time that he wrote this prophecy? Well, he's in Babylon. So he was in Babylon. We have an angel going through the midst of Jerusalem. But if this is a prophecy, was it fulfilled in Ezekiel's time? No. Was this prophecy fulfilled in Ellen White's time in 1902 when she wrote this? No. Nope. So manuscript 165 from 1902 is yet to be fulfilled. Would mm -hmm. you agree with this? No. Yeah. At the appointed time. At the appointed time. Is this the type of work that God wants to do? No. Is this not a strange work for God? Well, in some ways, I mean, the strange work is talking about the destruction of the wicked at the end of the world. I mean, this is not the ultimate destruction, but it's definitely not something that God wants to do. Right. Now she continues in paragraph 43. The 33rd chapter of Ezekiel is an outline of the work that God approves. Those in positions of sacred trust 
those honored of God by being appointed to stand as watchmen on the walls of Zion are in every respect to be all that is embraced in the meaning of the word watchman. Now, as I understand that, this takes us to Ezekiel 33, verses 2, 6, and 7. Yeah, and in Ezekiel um, chapter 33, it's actually repeating what's stated in Ezekiel chapter 3. Okay. Right, so uh, very similar anyway. Right. If you the two chapters, it's, it's, it's a repetition of the message given in chapter 3. And that's because in chapter 33, this is going to be when Ezekiel is no longer dumb. That is, he's now going to speak against the house of Israel. Now, Ezekiel 3 and 33, are they not typifying the movement today? Um, yeah. So yeah, they're, they're definitely connected to the movement. They're also connected to the church too, but but they do typify what's the movement itself, because this is the message that's to be given. Do any of us today state that we are not believers in the message of the Seventh Day Adventist faith? And if we are believers in that message, are we yet not part of the church? Yet we are part of the movement. The corporate message or? I don't care for the corporate message. Or the foundational message. The foundational messages. Yeah. Do we stand with the corporate message or do we stand with the message of the pioneers? It has to be the pioneers. So in order to be watchmen, she states, they are to be ever on guard against the dangers threatening the spiritual life and health and prosperity of God's heritage. Upon us as ministers, God has placed a burden of solemn responsibility. Is she talking about those that have gone through school to be seen as being doctors of divinity here or are we all seem to be as ministers to the world all of us realizing that we are his chosen watchmen we should have constant concern and forethought in regard to the state of the church we should give much time to earnest prayer for divine wisdom and guidance in order that we may know how best to promote God's honor and glory. He has commissioned us to honor him, the omnipotent one, in every word and in every act. From him comes our maintenance. We are wholly dependent upon his sufficiency, his bounty for our support. What does this say to us today? If we are to be wholly dependent upon him, if we, by faith, are willing to be dependent upon him for everything, do we then not learn the message of righteousness by faith in verity? This next letter was written January 1st of 1900. Consider the scene presented in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. So here again, we are to consider the prophecy of Ezekiel 9. Such a delineation needs to be carefully considered. When those who are set for the defense of true religion in our world become middlemen, leading the people to a knowledge of the truth, but failing to show the sanctifying power of truth upon their own hearts, the churches of Seventh-day Adventists are in danger of becoming corrupted through their defective characters, leading others astray. What does this say to you today? Well, the first thing is January 1st, 1900. January 1st is the first day of the first month as a symbol. Right. And then she speaks of delineation. That means setting something upon a line. Yes. We need to consider this line. Yes. And and that this line is illustrating 
um, what is going to happen to Seventh Day Adventists if they reject the messages? Yes. Not, even if they are professing to give those messages, if those messages don't have an effect upon them, then that's actually a testimony against them. Do you agree, brothers and sisters? What are your thoughts? Well, she talks yeah. about the delineation. Delineation, yeah. It's amazing. Yes. But notwithstanding the deplorable lack of vital godliness, there is a faithful remnant who sigh and cry for the abominations done in a land of professed knowledge and piety. Remnant who sigh and cry. Amazing. God is already writing in the record of some cases incurable. He is joined to his idols. Let him alone. Who is joined to his idols? Is this not Ephraim? Records of Ephraim. Yeah. The, con the conference itself could be an idol. People make yes. the conference an idol. The time is soon coming when the work of God's judgment will begin at his sanctuary. The time has not come, according to this letter in January 1st of 1900. She is predicting that the prophecy is soon to be fulfilled. Here we stand 124 years later reading these words. Do we wish to find that incurable is written on our records? Do we wish to have it said of us, he is joined to his idols, let him alone? God himself is now drawing the separating line. He says, also for me, as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their own heads. Ezekiel 9, verse 10. What carefulness should be, what carefulness should this work be in every soul who is striving for eternal life? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, Christ says, no more can ye except ye abide in me. John 15, 4. Keep this in mind. Every living branch is fruitful. What is the character of the fruit born? It is the most precious fruit. Love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Brothers and sisters, it's hard to read, to put these, to put these studies together, to hear the words of warning that Mrs. White wrote so many years ago that have been being set aside in thought, word, and action by so many within the church and within the movement. How are we to go forward? As we're coming to the close of our time together, do we have any further thoughts, comments, or questions today? I had a question in the chat. Yes. You had a question in the chat. Okay, I'll go back to the chat. Yeah. The, Just go ahead. It was his question was dealing with Edson about how he was raised, I guess. I'm not sure. Yes. Okay. Yes, Edson was very much grown up at that time. Because by 1888, I'm, I'm assuming he would have been somewhere in his 30s or his 40s. But the question is, was he grown up to discern right. between what's right and wrong? Okay. Why are you asking the question? What is particularly that you want? That's that Sister question? White's son. That's his, that's that's Sister White's son, right? By 1888, he would have been uh, about 39 years old. Now he was a bit of a problem child to some degree. 
And now, like, I was asking because this white wrote to him. He, he wrote to him a counsel that you have read just in those previous paragraphs. And then I was like, was he grown up by that time to know the 1888 message and refused it? That's what I was asking, but I've got to know it. Okay. Well, well, I would think the answer to that. So, I mean, Edson, from what I've read, you know, he, he, he made a lot of mistakes. But, I mean, later on, he was converted in his life, my understanding of it. Um, yeah, what I'm, what I'm reading very quickly is that it was not until he was about 44 years old, so about five years after this letter was written about him, that he had a spiritual change of heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Ellen White had him working in the South. Yeah, he, he believed that that was, that was something that really needed to be done. So, you know, at the time when she was down in, in Nashville and had her vision regarding the destruction of Nashville, I mean, uh, Edson was working in the South there and, and she was there, you know, partly to support the work that he was doing in the South. Right. <clears throat> Does that help to answer your question? Very much, sir. Thank you. Yes, brother. Thank you for the question. Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these words of warning. We thank you, Father, for your forbearance against our hard hearts. We thank you for the time that you are allowing us to come into a knowledge of you, of your character, and of that that you would have done in this world at this time. We thank you, Father, for this time that we've spent together. We ask, Father, for your guidance and direction. We pray for a blessing upon the message that is to come next. We ask, Father, that your angels may continue to protect us and that your spirit may continue to guide our minds in all that you would have us to do. Help us now to this end. Be with us, we ask. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.